Welcome to the Impact Lounge. You are in the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. This is the Cool Factor Podcast. I'm your host, TW. And of course, I got with me the man with the plan, BQ. Say what's up to the people. Yo, what's going on, everybody? This episode's coming out a little bit late this week. So just to get, you know, to be transparent, we usually record on Fridays. Uh, I, I live in the Midwest. We had the tornado out here. You might have seen about it in the news. And uh, that had us sheltered for a couple hours. <laughs> so we were getting ready to review, uh, review the episode, record the episode, and we just we couldn't do it. And um, Friday is just our day to do it. <laughs> so when we don't get to do our thing on Friday, it makes it pretty difficult for us to, uh, you know, because our schedules don't really jive after that. And um, right. everything, everything's cool here regarding the natural disaster, uh, but can't, you know, can't really say the same for about, you know, 20 miles south of us, unfortunately. Uh, but that's not what this podcast is about. But that was, um, uh, that, that did go down. So we're likely not reviewing the actual episode of Impact this week. Uh, we didn't really think anything happened, anything, you know, they, they I mean, they listed, they, uh, they listed who the members of the Ultimate X match were going to be and everything. But other than that, dude, this, I gave a lot of props to the last couple of weeks. I was like, these are really good episodes. Great set of tapings. I wasn't feeling it this week personally. So, you know what, since we're here, since we're here, let's just go ahead and hit on this week's, uh, this week's impact. So like you mentioned, there was okay. only two, two noteworthy things coming out of this show. One was they, they announced the participants in the first ever knockouts ultimate X match. Um, and for those of you who didn't see those participants are going to be, let's see who we got here. It's lady frost, Jordan grace. Um, who else? Who else? Who else? One second, one second. Uh, Tasha Steeles, okay. Lady America. Frost, Tasha Steeles, Rachel Ellering, Jordan Grace, Chelsea Green, and Rosemary. So, what do you think of that group for the? Think about the conversation we had previously about, you know, uh, the 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 type of person who we think might be a good fit for the first ever Knockouts Ultimate X match. And based off your thoughts then, and now that we know who the actual group is, what do you think of this group? Do you think this is a good group for, for this match? No, yeah, this is a great group. I think they really, uh, really nailed it as far as the participants go. I think these are just the right girls. They're, they're ones who are, you know, the most talented or, or uh, showing the most potential at this point in their career. So I think they're the, the ones that really fit. Uh, the type of match. So I think, I think it's, dude, I think this is going to be fingers crossed. It's going to be an amazing match. I really think it is. Of course, there's a potential that this doesn't work, <laughs> but uh, I think it's going to be good. I think they got the right, the right girls for it. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I agree. This is a group, a, a, a very, very athletic group. Um, I think, you know, again, it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a bunch of hanging from, the the structure and you know right, swinging right. down and doing all that stuff um i think the people in this match can do that but there's there's a lot of ways to do a a, a a good match it doesn't have to be exactly what you've seen before and i think you know again you know somebody like jordan grace like she's such a she's such a dope athlete like all you gotta do is look at her instagram and see the stuff that she's doing um i, I guarantee she can scale her way across you know the rope or the you know the scaffolding and all of that you know, Tasha Stills, she looks like she could do that. Chelsea Green, I get, I'd be willing to bet money. Chelsea Green is like an ace on any type of, you know, uh, American Ninja Warrior type, you know, structure. Um, she just she just looks like that kind of athlete. Uh, Lady right. Frost looks like she's a really good athlete. Rachel Ellering, I'd be interested. I think she's going to have to get creative with, uh, with, with going for, for the, you know, briefcase or whatever they have hanging from, from, the, uh, from the structure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's dope. I think it's dope. I think it's, 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 it's going to be fun. And I think anytime you can see something you've never seen before, that's what you're here for, you know, because we've all seen, it feels like we've seen everything in wrestling a hundred times. So 
anytime you can see something you've never seen before, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. I think this is definitely going to be a, a dope match. I will say, though, I, I when they announced who was going to be in it, I'm, first of all, thank God they're bringing Gail Kim on screen uh, for an authority figure. Because Scott Demore is killing me, dude. I, it's it's almost like he is. It's a, it's like a rib at this point. How much he can get on the show, and half of the segments don't need him. That's what that's what I think is bothering people about his inclusion on the show. Because you remember, you know, when for years Monday Night Raw used to have the general manager. You know what I mean? And they always kicked off the show every, right, right. and then you know, that make the main event and this and this, and then you didn't see him the rest of the episode, regardless of what happened. <laughs> there was not, you know, the authority figure in most cases was not like interwoven into the show, which maybe that's a good or bad thing, but um, it, it's just like, he, he just keeps popping up when he doesn't need to be. So I think adding Gail Kim was cool, but when, when she was listening to competitors, all I could think of was like, man, I would have loved some kind of like really big presentation, like, you could have had Gail Kim come to the middle of the ring and, uh, you know, kind of like they used to do in knockouts, knockdown, like, you know, uh, announce the girls one by one, you know, yeah. they, they could have, you could have got the crowd involved. She could have got out there and the first participant is, and then Rachel Ellering's music hit or Jordan Grace's hits or whatever, you know what I mean? And then Rosemary's yeah. hits last, you, you know, like get the people involved instead of, instead of just, the participants will be this and this. Like, there's just there's really creative ways you could do this to get people hyped and to make us feel it, right? You know, so that that's kind of what I was thinking at the time. But as far as the participants, you know, I think they definitely nailed it. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Uh, the other thing coming out of this show, <coughs> um, call me crazy, but looking at the way that they are putting together the storylines heading into the hard to kill main event. It feels to me like they want you to think that Matt Cardona is about to win the impact world title. What do you think about that? Yeah, I would say so. I would agree with that. Um, the one thing I want to say real quick before I forget, I talk a lot about impact, not really connecting with the audience for their, their shows. I always say there's a, there's a disconnect. You don't see, you know, I would say this set of tapings, we're getting the most energy from a crowd we've seen in forever. But for a normal episode, for the, for a regular episode, from what we've seen over the last couple of years, I have always said it doesn't look like the crowd is, have, is, is engaged and having fun like you'll see at Ring of Honor or even NWA for that matter. Right. And, you know, and I, I brought up many times that I went to Orlando and I'm watching them wrestle. I got no clue what the fuck the storylines are mm. it's just they're just coming out and they're just they're just wrestling and and we're supposed to pop to you know and i like i use the example when josh matthews was announced as the the whatever for matt seidel years ago the spiritual advisor yeah. but not one bit of that storyline actually played out in the arena so <laughs> when he came out like the crowd was dead because they were just like what are you, you know what i mean so the reason I'm bringing that up is because they're announcing the competitors for the match. You know, Dave Panzer and goes, the following is a special stipulation match scheduled for one fall. What the fuck is the stipulation? <laughs> the people in the, the arena don't know. So oh, why are we cheering? All they see is Matt Cardona fighting uh, Morrissey for the 50th time. And it's just like, what are we cheering? What? we're not getting invested in Matt Cardona beating the dude because we know his, his shot at his um, main event status is on the line. They don't, they don't know anything like that. They're just watching a match. They don't even know if it's the main event of the show. Right. You, you know what I mean? Like that match could have been taped first. It could have taped, been taped in the middle, just the way they do their stuff. So that's something I wanted to point out that there's, you know, to connect with the audience, like you have to, tell them the story they have to know what they're what they're cheering for right, otherwise right. they're just just hey all right good yeah he won like they're not getting invested in it because they don't know what the hell the stipulation is that's just crazy okay. that it's just a special following stip, special special stipulation match it's for one fall like what's the stipulation right yeah. craziness oh, yeah. but but we know that like for a long time they're like now we know there was so much going on behind the scenes there you know what i mean that I'm sure they were literally, and it, honestly, when you look back on it, 
it's kind of amazing the product they put together given all the turmoil that was happening backstage. I yeah. mean, for one, you had talent and production people who had no idea if their checks were going to clear. You know what I mean? Like Dixie was hustling people to, yo, just come in here and do your job real quick. And yeah, 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 yeah. trust me, it's going to clear. Yeah, yeah, it'll be good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you. And, and by the way, this is not me bashing Dixie. This is, this is documented in court. Okay, this is the court documented filings tell you all of this. Uh, I mean, it, it's crazy. It's it's amazing. If you go back and look at, you know, that Impact product from a lot, so many of those years, man, it is pretty impressive, the product they were able to put together. Um, and, but, you know, but like I said, but but we're here now. And I think, I think, uh, I think we can kind of segue, we can kind of segue here a little bit to something that we were talking about before we came on, which is... Um... Well, well, I didn't quite answer your question. Oh, I'm sorry. I, go, go ahead. Go I, ahead, got go into ahead. A, I, I got into a ramble. But, but, <laughs> but just before we get into that, so that way I'm not just ignoring what you asked me. You asked mm-hmm. if Cardona is essentially being presented like he's going to win the match. I think that is where they're going with it. And you kind of have to do that because triple threats with two heels are really, really hard to do. Uh, and I do hate the fantasy book, but I feel like the chances of a double turn between him and Cardona, I mean, a Cardona and, and uh, Morrissey is a possibility. Or if it's not a double turn, this could set the groundwork for Cardona going heel because I think, I really think Chelsea Green is going to win the uh, Ultimate X match. Mm-hmm. And they just both need to be heels, like 100%. <laughs> they don't need to be baby faces at all. Well, why does and Chelsea I, Green need to be a heel? She's so. <laughs> I just think she She's was so nice. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like when she was a heel in TNA before, I think she did really good work. And the thing is in NWA, because she wrestles there as well. She's the hot mess gimmick over there. Okay. She's similar to what she was as Laurel Van Ness. And then here she's just kind of, I don't want to call her like white meat, but she's just a baby. Like there's not, and I'm watching on the NWA and I'm just like, dude, I want that. You know, mm. um, so I'm not saying she's going to go that route, but she's just a heel on that show. And I'm okay. just like, man, that's just a better role for her. Uh, but but putting the two of them together in a heel a, as heels, I just can see it happening. Okay. I don't know if it'll happen or not. I just think they're they're trying to push this baby face Cardona thing. And so do you think Cardona line. will actually win at Hard to Kill? No, no, he won't. I, I can't imagine he wins. They they can't. They're not going to make Moose drop, lose it like that. No way. Now you got me thinking. Uh, I I I don't think. I mean, Moose just got the title. I think this is all. You know, I think I think everything here is to set up uh, time killing in order to get back to Moose and and Josh Alexander, which I love. By the way, I love this idea of. True. You know, you had Josh Alexander, you know, go through this great battle to get the title. You have Moose basically steal his moment. And then you put all these obstacles in between them till eventually they come back together, you know, for for uh, Alexander's big shot. Which and I, I love it. I think it's a great I think it's I think that's a great way to do it. Like because mm-hmm. all you're doing. I think this is how you should build every match. Right. Like right. if your big match that you're planning for, let's say Slammiversary is going to be Moose versus Josh Alexander, then Moose nor Josh Alexander should be losing between now. Well, I mean, it's okay for a babyface to lose. I, I, I changed that. It's okay for a babyface non-champion to lose, especially when you're trying to get the crowd behind him. But he needs to look super duper dominant. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Super duper dominant. Um and it looks like I'm I'm interested in Josh Alexander versus Jonah. I, I I'm interested to see what, what they're gonna do with that. Um, but yeah, him and Moose, they both need to just be running through everybody until we get a compelling story of their you know rematch at uh I guess slam anniversary. Yeah, they're doing a good job with it. Very, very good job. So I did cut you off because you were segueing into something else. Well, I was going to segue kind of to something that's honestly a much bigger story. Like I said, there wasn't that much, like you said, there wasn't much show, much uh, coming out of this show to really talk about. But 
there was a very big story in the world of wrestling um, that, you know, by all, by all, all looks kind of culminated this past weekend. Uh, Ring of Honor had their final battle pay-per-view on, was it Saturday or Sunday? One of those days. And um, I mean, it was, it was a, it was a quality show. I've never been a fan of the Ring of Honor product. I don't hate on the Ring of Honor product, but there's some things about it I don't love. You know what I mean? The the no selling and the, you know what I mean? That's not really my speed. Like I watched the main event between um, John Gresham and Jay Lethal. And I know you haven't seen it yet, but um, like I said, it's just, you know, if, if you like that style, you'll love it. If you like that style, you'll love it. But that style is not really my cup of tea. Um, I don't even like tea, but, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, one of the bigger moments from that show was Deanna Perrazzo. She came out after the Ring of Honor Women's Championship match to challenge the Ring of Honor Women's Champion, Roxy. Uh, Deanna said she's going to take the knockouts title back from Mickey James at Hard to Kill. And she then will be challenging Roxy for the Ring of Honor Women's title. And I thought that was just super interesting. One, because Deanna Perrazzo got a way better pop in front of that ROH crowd than I've heard her get an impact. By the way, she shouldn't be getting pops and impact anyway because she's a dirty, filthy, nasty, disgusting heel. She's a bad guy. She's a bad, bad, bad guy. And she shouldn't be getting cheered. So, uh, but she got a big pop in front of that Ring of Honor crowd. And it made me wonder, BQ, it made me wonder, is the ROH crowd just better than the Impact crowd? Like, wh- why are they popping for Deanna Perrazzo way better than the Impact crowd? Well, I think the difference between her coming out on an episode of Impact and then the Ring of Honor show is that the Ring, Honor, Ring of Honor show was full of surprises and people were conditioned to believe that people from other companies were going were gonna to step out. And that audience really wanted that because they, that was the company that didn't get to participate in the forbidden door thing. And we always wonder like, why, why aren't they involved? Uh, and now we see why, you know, because of the status of the company, but the R- the ROH fan base has always just been a, a rowdy fan base. Uh, but ring of honor also knows who their fans are. They, they, they have a target audience there. You know, I've knocked impact about this a little bit. Like who's your audience? Who, 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 who are you trying to make wrestling for? Right. You know, uh, Ring of Honor knows exactly who their audience is. And uh, there's that connection with the fan. There's just, there's just that connection. I just said a little while ago about talking about disconnects and things like that. Like Ring of Honor is not disconnected with who's in the audience. They know how to present stuff that, that makes the people react. I mean, that just, you know, but I'm also not a fan of the no selling stuff. You know, that, that's a part of AEW that I can't stand, but Ring of Honor was like, um, I don't remember what the last pay-per-view I, I, I used to order every single ring of honor pay-per-view dude. And then one day I was just like, dude, every match is the same speed, the same complete lack of selling. Like you, it's, it's essentially like what a lot of AEW matches are where like you have to, you know, do, you have to almost kill somebody. Like you stop damn near short of, a, of shooting them to beat them. And I can't, that's really hard for me to get into. Right. Um, uh, <laughs> that was this one. <laughs> um, yes. So, uh, I, I, I want to, I want to give Deanna Perrazzo her flowers here a little bit. Okay. Uh, the, the, the nasty, disgusting, vile human being that she is. I want to give her some flowers for a minute Archimosa. because Deanna Perrazzo, man, like she, at this point, you, you have to respect her. No matter what you think of, you know, whether you thought she was a, um, uh, uh, whether you thought she couldn't hack it in WWE, you know what I mean? Whether you thought she left there because she wasn't good enough, you know, whatever. You thought she was a small fish in a big pond or whatever. Uh, what, whatever your criticism may be of Deanna Perrazzo, at this point, you have to recognize her. When you start thinking of women outside of WWE, you have to mentioned Deanna Perrazzo. You have to. And even if you include women in WWE, if you're going to do a top five or top 10, damn it, Deanna Perrazzo better be in your top three. And if it's, and if she's not, then you just out of your mind. I, I can't imagine. I mean, like, 
there, listen, there's there's certain arguments you could be made that could be made uh, for 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 different people. Um, in my opinion, like the fact that WWE currently has you know Charlotte Flair, um, Sasha Banks, you know Bianca Belair, super on her way. People really love Rhea Ripley, but I don't think she's there yet. Um, you know, um, um, oh, that Becky Lynch, they're not making Becky Lynch, uh, Bailey, like, you know, WWE has a women's roster that is just untouchable at this point, but, but you have to recognize what Deanna Perrazzo has accomplished, bro. You have to, she has taken the knockouts title, um, and, and, and not, not only, not only elevated the knockouts title, but elevated her own status, which is very hard to do. Um, she's elevated her own status without being in one of the two biggest companies. And she, and when she walks into a room, it means something. When she, if she steps into AAA on the stage, it means something. If she steps into impact, obviously it means something. NWA, it means something. ROH, any indie, it means something. She has done that. And, and you know, you have to, you know, obviously we know this is a, a scripted sport, but you have to be a quality enough talent that promoters from multiple promotions are willing to let you go over on their show. You know what I mean? Like, you know, people can say what they want to about uh, the, the, the way Impact looked in their relationship with AEW, but Impact was a willing participant in this Kenny Omega's The Greatest Wrestler story because they didn't lose any credibility by having the top player from the second biggest wrestling company come in here and say he's better than everybody on your show. Whether you like it or not, that doesn't make you lose anything because everybody believes that anyway. And so Deanna Perrazzo is doing that exact same thing for women. There is no other woman in the wrestling business right now who is going company to company, just putting their foot down on the stage and saying, I'm the attraction the way that Deanna Perrazzo is right now. you got to respect it. What's bananas, if you look at her story... The she participated in a couple knockouts knockdowns back in the day. Uh, I remember her taking on Madison Rain. She just had the the yellow outfit with the little Italian flag, and she's just you know this happy to be there character. And I remember back then. I mean, I've always been a fan of her, but I remember back then thinking, man, I would love for them to bring her on. But I was like, but what's her what's her gimmick like? What's I, I was just like, she's just kind of a, a wrestler. And I think she would tell you the same things. I, I, I've actually heard her say the same thing uh, in interviews, you know, like I, I didn't really have a gimmick. I was just, I was just a, a wrestler, you know? And I think about those days though. And I would have never in a million years, she was one of my very first interviews uh, back when I used to do interviews with Robbie E. Um, and he used to get me guests. Uh, she was like my second interview ever or something like that. Uh, I remember back, she was like a teacher, you know, she was teaching and wrestling and, and doing all this stuff and, and just knowing like the, her backstory and then thinking of the knock, knockouts, knockdown days, I would have never in a million years, if you're just like, yo, in seven, eight years, this is going to be the best or one of the best female wrestlers on the planet. And she's going to command attention when she's out there and she's going to, she's going to be holding multiple championships from major promotions at the same time. And she's, I would have never, you would have never convinced me that it wasn't that she wasn't talented. I just, it, it's the growth she's shown is in, incredible, you know, from, from there to, to now. And again, if you are a promoter right now, if you're a promoter, if you can't book a woman from WWE, who's the first name on your list? It's yeah. gotta be Deanna Perrazzo. You know what I mean? It has mm -hmm. to be. Um, and so like you just, you got, and, and even, you know, like you mentioned about like, you know, her outfits, by the way, her, her ring gear, always top notch, you know what I mean? Always top notch. And if you notice the subtle switch of gear that she's done since losing the knockouts title is like, 
a tiny little twist of character, right? Like yeah, just saying, it. you know, I've, 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 I've lost my title. So I'm going to this other place so that I can turn up and get it back. And she's been consistent. Like it's the jeans and the t-shirt and the taped hands. And I'm like, dog, I, I love this. This, these are the little subtleties that you don't see in wrestling anymore. This is people saying, yo, I'm going to just take my character in a little bit of a change of direction. Taya was excellent about that when she was in Impact. Just little things like saying, okay, now I'm doing the, you know, what was it like the, the, the housewives of slam town or whatever, you know what I mean? Like she would tweak her character between that and between, you know what I mean? When she was just being like, you know, a, a, a badass. but I'm just saying like, I just had to take a minute and give Deanna Perrazzo her flowers because uh, she has, when you talk about capitalizing on an opportunity, bro, like there's no better example in the wrestling business of somebody who's taken their opportunity and run with it. And she's doing, and, and what she's doing, by the way, is elevating the whole business. It really is. Because while she's going around promotion to post, promotion, blah, 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 promotion to promotion and and making money she's also bringing them a feature attraction so uh shout out to diana perrazzo you disgusting vile uh evil heel of a person <laughs> um <laughs> like, damn i actually totally forgot what i was gonna say uh oh no um just just a touch on subscribe to diana perrazzo's only fans and <laughs> it's quite steamy just to, <laughs> to, to, to kind of know, uh, to follow up on uh, what you were saying, uh, she's changing the ring gear and everything. You think about all like the John Cena title reigns where it was just like, he had a green shirt. He was the champion, lost it, came back with a red shirt, won the title. With the exception of some wardrobe changes, as the color of his t-shirt, he was just the same dude just flatline just the same no character growth progression for years and it got super stale to people and just like the even look at the good brothers tag team title reigns like they have two title reigns they're, they they both feel exactly the same they're just boring there's they're just it people get bored when you just keep winning titles but the you don't get any better as an on-screen character and it would get dry if she was just like, I'm, I'm just the virtuosa, just the same right, character right. she was three, four months ago. I'm just, I'm the virtuosa, this and this, and I'm getting my title back. And then she gets the title back and then she's the virtuosa again. Like show, yeah, show, this is an opportunity for her to show some growth and she's doing that and just doing an excellent job of it. Hell yeah. So. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So shout out to you, Deanna Perrazzo, you vile, disgusting, filthy heel. <laughs> uh, what, <laughs> what uh what 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 else is on your plate we're gonna wrap up here soon what 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 else what else you want to hit on before we go i think for everybody out there watching like be like be, be like bq told you we really are you know what i mean moving heaven and earth to get you guys a pod this week um but we got some really fun stuff planned for next week um as always you know, drop your, your, your comments in the comment section. We're going to do, I think what we'll do going forward is probably like a once a month, we'll do a mailbag show. You know what I mean? Like maybe every third week or so, you know what I mean? Like something like that. We'll, we'll do a mailbag show where we'll just, you know, answer you guys questions every week. So keep the questions and, and comments, you know, coming down there in the comment section. Um, something we're going to do, maybe we'll do this for the next show. If everyone, if you haven't already, the Impact Year End Awards, uh, Impact posted a tweet where they have uh, a survey out for you to vote for the Impact Year End Awards. Uh, we're going to do our own Impact Year End Awards. But I think what we'll do next episode is we are going to look through those awards and we're going to make the case for why somebody should win. So we'll, 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 we'll look through... Uh, you know, the category for knockout of the year, wrestler of the year, match of the year, and we'll make a case for why somebody should win. That doesn't necessarily mean who we think is going to win or who we think should win, but we're just going to make a case. We're going to, we're going to be lawyers. It's going to be like a uh, law and order impact lounge. <laughs> so here's what I want to talk about next. This, uh, so this news is, I don't know if you want to call it news, 
it's a little bit old, but uh, Jonah did an interview recently, and as every what it seems like, ninety percent of the people who we see on Impact was just basically like, "I'm not signed to this company." Uh, he, but he is doing New Japan and Impact Wrestling, so he's involved in both. Uh, he has said that his priority is New Japan, which, you know, it, it's fine. It's it's much like the Good Brothers, where he's like, hey, we got our promotion out here, and we got our promotion here. So, you know, it works for him. But we've had a lot of discussion about, you know, these people coming on, and they're just, they're not contracted. They're just, they're just showing up. And it's like, we, we just want to hear, yo, this person signed with Impact Wrestling. And it just doesn't, we just don't get that. That's not their business model. And then I was thinking, their business model is pretty much the same thing MLW's is at the moment. But MLW has done a better job of marketing that business strategy and communicating it to the audience, saying, you know, we're, we're open for business here. Uh, we are going to have our contracted talent, but we're also going to bring people in for sets of tapings, or they might come in for one match, or they might come in from a pay-per-view. Like, they said all these things. They communicated all these things so that, you know, again, this just target audience. Like, they know how to talk to their people. They're, they're basically saying, hey, we're going to have our core MLW people, but we're going to cycle people in as well. That's essentially what Impact is doing, but they're not saying it. Mm -hmm. And think of the graphic, when you see the graphic saying, you know, Tits McGee is all elite, you know, <laughs> that's their, that's one of their big social media strategies where when you see that, that is all elite graphic, like that means something. That's, that's a really big deal to the fan base. And, and it helps tell the, tell the, uh, tell the viewers, Hey, these are the people who are signed. And if you don't see these graphics, like, they're not signed. They're just here right. doing their thing. But it's, it's just very clear cut for the most part. And MLW is doing that. They're saying, hey, this is who we, we're going to bring people in. And then we have people who are contracted to the company. But Impact doesn't do that. We don't have that, okay, is this person signed? Are they just here for a set of tapings? Are they here for a paper? We have no clue. And that's where some of that disconnect lies again a little bit. You know what I mean? So... I just thought about it. I was like, they're, they're essentially the same thing that MLW is doing. It's just MLW is communicating it in, in a clear cut manner. Mm -hmm. And Impact is just, you know, I'm not saying what Impact's doing is wrong necessarily. It's just, it just, we don't know. We don't know who's part of the company and who's not. Right. You know? Um, and I think all this kind of really wraps up together, right? I, like the messaging. Um, you know, the promotions, you know, are you taking a big swing? Are you not? I, I, I feel like it all goes together. You know, um, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't know sometimes like what the direction is of the company. You know what I mean? Like, are they really pushing, trying to grow? Like, you know, early on people were clowning AEW, calling them a t-shirt company, but you know what? At least you knew that they were, they were, you know, pressing up t-shirts to keep the memes going and you know all of that stuff um just having some sort of like identity right like you know again what type of identity does impact really have what 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 what, what really can we even characterize as their identity again aw right like i characterize them as like the american version of new japan and roh right like the the uh, you know that's whatever and so but again, and, and WWE, you know, obviously you characterize them. They're the biggest money maker. They're the, you know, market everything. They got the theatrics. They got everything. They, they do all that super duper well. We just don't know how to characterize impact. And by the way, that's not our job. That's not our job to figure out how to characterize impact. That's their job. It's impact's job to teach the audience how we should see them. You know what right. I mean? Like yeah. if, if, if you, if, if somebody was, you know, uh, describing this show, it's up to us to come up with, uh, to, to present the show in a manner that's consistent, right? In a way that people could say these, if you, if you listen to this show, these guys are going to give you this, you know, you can count on 
the cool factor pod for this. You know what I mean? So, uh, but, but again, with impact, I just don't know what you fill in that blank with. You know what I mean? And yeah. I, you don't and, know how to answer that question. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and again, even uh, again, I just, I can think back to three or four different WWE slogans, you know, just in my brain, like readily available from being a kid. It's the new generation. You know what I mean? Like they're always so clear with their messaging. This is who we are and this is what we're doing. And you don't see that from impact. No, you don't. And it's, that's why, you know, I've, I've been, God, till I'm blue in the face talk about marketing. Cause when you have good marketing, you, uh, you can do, I'm probably not going to ex- explain this properly, but you can do like word association, like, you know, you can, let me, let me not put it like that. Um, I'm just going to scrap what I was just going to say, because I know what, I know the pic, the picture I'm trying to paint for you guys, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I haven't used this analogy in a really long time. So I don't want to confuse people, but it does go back. It does go back to the marketing. Good marketing is a clear message. It's, this is what we offer. This is what we provide. This is the value you'll get when you, watch our product and it just always feels like uh impacts throwing shit at the wall and see what sticks and it seems like they've been doing that for years you yeah. know it's there's just not a real clear cut direction which is i'm not saying that's like necessarily bad because they they are trying to find what works right you know but it's it just seems like it's years of throwing shit at the wall and you like know a monkey yeah, yeah, there we go. Like, if you want to, if you want to be like, okay, like our identity is we're going to bring, we're going to have like the best women's division in wrestling, which mm. for the most part, that that's probably the one identity you can give them, but it's, they haven't gone all in on the knockouts like that. You know what I mean? They're, they do feature the women a lot, but not like they could really feature them and really give them time. You know, the, the only matches that really get a whole lot of time are title matches. Yeah. You know, the only feuds that have interesting storylines have the title attached to them. Right. You know, so I, I wouldn't say they've gone like all in to where like, hey, we're going to establish this division as number one. And, and it's going to be clear cut. That's where we're going with it. They'll remind you that, hey, we're the knockouts when every time another company does something really good with their females, oh, hey, hey, don't forget about us. We're the knockouts. Right. We're number one. Yep, yep. Like, you know, so it used to be the X Division once upon a time. Like, that was their that was their staple. So you can't say that they never had a clue who their audience was. Like, there was a time where they're like, we're going to prevent us, we're going to present a style of wrestling that you're not seeing on WWE. But now the X division style, a lot of people are doing the X division style, you know? So now what is your brand? What is your brand of wrestling? If someone's like, what is different about your show that I can't get from watching ring of honor, right? Watching MLW. Like what, what is the brand? Like even NWA is providing their own brand of wrestling. And it's not like there's not ideas out there they can come up with because there's, every single company I just mentioned came out after impact. There was one point where, <coughs> excuse me, TNA and WWE were the only people out there. So it's not like you didn't have this world of possibilities of, Hey, this is the direction we want to take the company. You, right. you see all these companies come out after the fact and, and ring of honor is like, Hey, we're going to pre- present this style of wrestling. MLW is like, we're going to do this. NWA is like, we're going to do this. Lucha underground was even like, we're going to do this. AEW was like, we're going to do this. And then like impact still like, we're just putting on a good wrestling show. Right. You know, and this like, isn't a knock it. This is, this is because we, we love the company. That's why it concerns us. We just want to see a direction, you know, like a clear, clear freaking cut direction. So let me, let me, let me put you in the chair. Let me put you in Scott Demore's golden chair. And let me ask you BQ. You get the, the, the blank check from Anthem, and they tell you, all right, look, let, 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 let's, let's, uh, let's breathe some life into this wrestling company. 
What what are you doing? What's the first thing you're doing? Uh, are you saying as far as like creating an identity? Yep, for Impact so, Wrestling. So I would going back like to what I said. Get, is, how do we get the Impact crowd as lively as the NXT crowd or the ROH crowd? Like how do we how do we breathe it breathe that kind of juice into the fan base? Now that there, there's a lot. That's a long answer, um, but. To go back, I guess, to if they were like, hey, how do we make, how do we st- make this company stand out? I would start with the, the women, start with the knockouts, and they look like they're going that direction. This is, I do think this is the best division they've ever had. I say that because even the, knock, like the amazing knockouts divisions, if you were to put all, a p- image of all those women up against each other, you'd see Gail Kim, you see Awesome Kong, you see Taryn Terrell, you see Mickey James. And then after that, it, it it drops off. You know, there's Madison Rain and there's Angelina Love, but there there's a we, we talked about the Mount Rushmore. Like there there's like four or five like iconic knockouts, and the rest were, in my opinion, talking about the Brooke, Brooke Test mockers and all that. I feel like they were they were a level beneath those girls. With this division, I think top to bottom, like as far as being well rounded. <coughs> good lord. This is the best division I think they've had. And that is the area where I don't think anyone has a strong stranglehold on women. On We, we have the best women's wrestling here. NXT was pretty close. Some women? What's that? You want to put a stranglehold on some women? No, okay. that's not what I was saying. <laughs> stranglehold on women's wrestling. Saying, hey, this is the best women res- women's wrestling you'll find anywhere. NXT was pretty close, and then they rebranded, and now it's – that that's – I did like NXT a lot when I first started watching this 2.0 thing. Now I'm getting a little bit bored, but mm. I would start there. I would start with, you know, I think Impact had established himself as having a legitimate heavyweight division that other companies don't. Other companies are putting have been putting belts on smaller guys for a while. Now, granted, Big E, Roman Reigns, some bigger dudes, but you know, if you think about the AEW champions you know, all normal sized dudes. Ring of Honor was putting, you know, the belt on smaller guys. Uh, and, and WWE's done it too. NXT's done it. We, we just, we're in this era of like smaller champions. Right now, like Moose is, Moose is the guy. Yep. He's got the, champ, the championship. And there are some heavyweights in the coming. There's Jonah. You know, you, you could say Josh Alexander. I think he's not as tall as we perceive him to be. And I say that because in front of Christian Cage, Christian Cage was towering him. Yeah. Um, you know, Christian's but then you got like W more. Though. Christian's like six four. So Josh Alexander's probably about six one. Yeah. So maybe. Yeah. So I, I'm just saying, like, you know, my brother's six one. He's my little brother, he's a lot taller than I am. But I don't see my brother and see a giant. You know what I mean? Yeah, right, 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 so right. I don't right. um but I think they could establish a, a legitimate heavyweight division. And mm-hmm. I don't think, and I think they have the people for it. You know, you, you got Madman Fulton, too. You, you get, you got big guys, but you haven't established that level of branding. Like, hey, we ha- this is where the heavyweights come to play. Yeah. You know, you could essentially bring that back because that's a style of wrestling that's like gone away. You could actually uh, bring that back. And then as far as, you know, like I said, as you, as you asked, connecting with the audience and stuff, um, I thought Matt Stryker was doing a really good job at, yeah. You know, what was the pay per view or the uh, Impact Plus special, whatever we just had? Uh, I, turning we, point was that turning it? point. So yeah. I thought he did an excellent job of because I, I I just went on a rant two weeks before that, two three weeks when I said, hey, I was at AW uh, Rampage, and in between commercials, wrestlers were coming out and talking to the fans and cutting promos. Um, Justin Roberts was keeping. <coughs> excuse me, I'm coughing today. Justin Roberts was keeping the crowd fired up. Tony Khan came out and talked about like they kept the energy in that arena. And what I was told is they just play we own the night between matches, <laughs> you know, and um, <laughs> shocking, <laughs> real, real shocking. But I would just do a better job at the over the, at the, ex, the fan experience. You talk about the fan experience quite a bit, but I do a better job of improving the fan experience while you're there. Like you're communicating with the fans. You never hear the ring announcer like the following match is a number one contenders match for the something right. like 
they don't know what they're watching. They're just watching wrestling matches. Good point. Great point. You no, know? and that there has to be like more communication with the audience. So um, that's going to go a long way, I think, to towards just a, a live, livelier, more energetic audience. You know, I, I brought up this in the past too: the Grand Championship. They never announced the rules to the live audience mm-hmm. at any point. They just came out and started doing a round system and saying who won the rounds. These people have no clue what the hell they're watching. Right. The world title series, that long thing where they just brought it back to EC3 and Matt Hardy at the end. Where, I don't know why they didn't just have them wrestle to begin with. because They was, just did so many matches. It was clear at that And I had actually read this on some website, but it was clear once I watched it, this was happened. Like they, I, I remember reading, you know, Impact, they basically only had a budget for uh for like another weekend of tapings so they just taped as many random matches as they could and then in post-production they announced that world title series nonsense (laughs) and they said that all those matches were part of the world title series and they were like we'll figure it out somehow later um and we're gonna end up back with ec3 and matt hardy when we get some more money and i was like damn yes, yes and the fans didn't know they didn't know what they were watching you know so it that just really weird to me that that level of communication isn't there. Like that's just yeah. insane. Yeah. But that's a long question. We could we could talk all day about. No, that was, that was really good. That was really good. But I, I have a couple of critiques on your on your list. Uh, first okay. of all, uh, in terms of knockouts, um, aces and eights. Brooke Tessmacher was elite, elite. Okay, <laughs> aces and eights. Brooke Tessmacher. I didn't say all Brooke Tessmacher, but aces and eights. Brooke Tessmacher was elite okay <laughs> and uh um um whew, yeah sorry all right oh uh, these guys got got caught in the memory lapse for a second um the other thing though i thought you actually hit on a gold mine idea which is if anybody from impact is listening which i know some of you are go all in on the knockouts man go promote yourself as the company the like put the knockouts out front promote yourself as the company that features women's wrestling. Like, yeah, you know, WWE has Becky Lynch and they treat her like a legit top star, like not a top female star. They, t- they treat her like a legit top star. And guess what? If you were, if you were listening to the early part of this podcast, you have one of those on your roster right now. Treat Deanna Perrazzo like a top star, <coughs> not a top knockout. Treat her like a top star. Put her out front in everything you do. She has shown that she can be a traveling champion and rep your brand. Open the checkbook, pay her to go around and rep Impact Wrestling the way that Ric Flair did in the 80s with the NWA. Because she's already basically doing it. And just like BQ said, you need to just go all in on the knockouts, man. Go all in on knockouts. Promote yourself as the place where women's wrestling lives and thrives because you know look AEW has some good players but like you know i'm not going to go into it again but like AEW has some very specific targets for their marketing and it affects how they how and who they present you know with their product okay and so um so i think impact has just a, a truly truly great opportunity I, I wasn't even thinking about that bq like Impact should totally go all in on, they need to just change the presentation of knockouts division. Like they're very character based in the knockouts division, except for the women's world title scene. Other than that, it's all like gimmicky character stuff. Come on, man. Let's come on. Let's, let's, let's go with yeah, the they're wrestling. not, they're let's not getting those wrestling. like a lot of time having matches in the ring. I mean, I would take it back to the female ring announcer, the female referee, like, maybe even a, put a woman in charge of the division like they did before. Like that's what separates it. That's what brands a division is like, Hey, it's knockouts time. Like <clears throat> that's where it doesn't look like everything else and feel like everything else. And you know, this particular episode of impact, I gave a lot of props to the last two or three weeks. I didn't enjoy this show. Um, I, it felt really formulaic to me, you know, like Monday night raw is the most formulaic show of all time. You know, like Seth Rollins talked for 10 minutes you know do this and this like that it's they had this formula and 
I get that with Impact quite a bit. It's awesome match. Uh, uh, Striker and D'Lo, we own the night. Uh, Scott Demore, we own the night. Waste of time match. Waste of time match. Gia Miller backstage. Scott Demore interviews. We uh, interrupts. I'm saying uh, we own the night, and maybe a th- impact throwback. We own the night and good main event. And it's like, it's so like fluffy in the middle, man. But it's, it's the same. It just, it's like this storyboard of just the same shit from week to week. And that's where I'm saying with the knockouts, like if you do the, the knockouts ring announcer, the knockouts rapper, all that stuff, like you just create a portion of the show that feels completely different than everything else. And when it's convenient for them, they'll be like, hey, we have the number one women's division, but it's always very reactionary. Uh, the, <clears throat> the return of the knockouts knockdown, that's, that show was great. They did an awesome job with that. So I don't, I don't want to knock that at all, but it's, it's always very reactionary. It's reactionary when WWE is like, hey, we're putting, we have a main event of women this week. And then Impact's like, oh, get, guess, guess we were the first people to main event a show with, with women. You know, like it's just reactionary. It's... And there's probably people who are saying, well, they do feature the, the knockouts. Yeah, but like go all in. Like you, you don't understand what we're saying. All in so that it's this specific brand that you, you're like, can't wait for the knockout segment of the show. You know? Yeah, no, I, I love that. I, I'd even give, I'd even consider giving the knockouts their own show. You want to make a splash? You want to target a, a demo? You want to get people watching your show? who have never watched it before make a knockout show make you can make it an hour make a knockout show get get, get, why why not give them a a platform to shine give them a place where women from all all over the wrestling community could look at your product and say this is something i'm not getting anywhere else why not Mm -hmm. you got you got access tv Give, give them a show, uh, make BTI the knockout show. Or or cut Impact back to, you know how much better Impact would be if it was only an hour? Yeah. You, you probably never thought about that. I, for the long, I loved the NXT of the TakeOver era. A big reason why is because the show was only an hour. Mm-hmm. You could fit so much good stuff into an hour and not too much. And our wrestling show is easily consumable. I'm telling you, man, they could give the knockouts a show and they could either give them their own, you know, hour on like another night or before impact or make impact an hour and give the knockouts an hour. Right. I mean, uh, again, like take a swing, man. I think there's, there's nothing, you're not going to lose anything by featuring women, by promoting women. You know what I mean? Like you got Gail Kim, who's a recognized great in this business by everybody who's anybody. And you got Deanna Perrazzo, who is an active recognized great in this business by everybody who's anybody. Why not? Why not? So that's my piece. That's my piece. I don't know. You got anything else, BQ? I think, uh, I think we've uh, rung, rung the rag dry for tonight. <laughs> I, think, I think we've run it too. The last point I'll make is that we don't even know who they're going to bring over from, you know, the women of honor division. You know, we don't know if they're going to bring uh, Mia Yim back, Jade. We don't know if she's going to return. You know, it it's a good division and it has the potential to actually get a lot better here very soon. They're clearly striking out on the big name male free agents. They they just are. However you want to freaking paint that, they just are. They're not necessarily building new stars. They're doing they're doing it with Josh Alexander. I think they're doing it with Trey Miguel. I think they've given up on Jake something for some reason. But uh, and then I think they've cooled Chris Bay off quite a bit. But you know, there, there's a couple dudes where it's like, okay, we're we're building some stars here, but. They're not bringing in those guys. They're they're swinging for these free agent dudes, and they're just not landing them. But then you look at that; they just landed the inspiration. Like those were the biggest female free agents on the market at the time, and they they got them. It's a home for women's wrestling. Like women know they're going to go there and have we have we can have 
you know, pretty good matches. And they, you know, hey, these girls got knockouts, tag team titles now. You know, like there's so much we can do there. They need to go get uh, Allison K and Marty Bell. Yeah, I would, that's what I was going to bring up. Like, imagine if they showed up at some point with the NWA titles. Like, that would be, that would be really big. But there's, the potential is still there to to mold this knockout division so many different ways that that isn't there with the guys. Mm-hmm. You know, and even on the on the indies, uh, oh my god, uh, the mad esthetician Amber Rodriguez. Yo, she is. Yo, I, I'm telling you, man, just 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 look <laughs> her up on your on your Twitter. Like she's just. When you see when you see indie talents, you could tell there's like a level. You know what I mean? You could tell there's like a level of people who are like pretty much ready for TV. And I'm like, bro, she is gonna she is gonna shine so so hard when somebody puts her on TV. And like, if we're being honest, like Impact is still a developmental territory right now. It's a developmental show, a developmental company. Like. Impact should be bringing in people off the indies. You know what I mean? I mean, they just signed Lady Frost, so they are doing that. They are doing that. But I'm just saying, to me, she's somebody who I've seen out there who I just feel like she is so TV ready. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Star. <sighs> so. But all right, man. I think I, I think that's all I got for today. How about you? No, that, that will do it for me, too. All right. So, uh, real quick, BQ. Tell the people where they can find you on on these internet streets. At BQ Speaks on Twitter and at the in, excuse me at the Impact Lounge on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. That's right, that's right. And you can find me at TW Talking About on your social media of choice, or you can follow my podcast page at Talking About Pod. You can also follow my. You can go subscribe to my YouTube uh, for the Talking About Podcast. It's uh just search talking about pod. It's T A L K T A L K I N B O U T P O D. Uh and yeah, man. But um, you know, like we said earlier, please drop your comments. Make sure you hit the like button on this video before you go. Um, tell a friend to tell a friend. Let's bring more people into the conversation. For BQ, I'm TW, ladies and gentlemen. Peace.